Open the podcast doors, Hal. It's Kubrick's Universe, the Stanley Kubrick Podcast. Room Captain Mandrake speaking. Listen to me carefully. The base is being put on condition red. Not a good idea. I keep the men on their toes. Group Captain, I'm afraid this is not an exercise. The hell. It appeared that the order called for the planes to uh, attack their targets inside Russia. This man is obviously a psychotic. The doomsday machine. What is that? A device which will destroy all life on Earth. Gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is the war room. Dr. Strangelove. How is it possible for them to have built such a thing? It is not only possible. It is essential. Dimitri, there's no point in you getting hysterical at a moment like this. I wish we had one of them doomsday machines. Hey now, and welcome back to Kubrick's Universe, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. So you've just heard the new trailer to promote the theatrical release of the 4K restoration of (sighs) Dr. Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. It's been newly created and distributed by Park Circus. This all-new crisp and clean release is going to be screened in select cinemas in the UK, Ireland, and in several other European countries beginning in mid-May 2019. Now, earlier in 2019, our producer, editor, chief researcher, and all-around bon vivant for all things Kubrick, Stephen Rigg, got to know Matt Wells. Matt is a filmmaker and in-house producer at Park Circus, where he gets to make documentaries about some of the many films represented by the company. Matt's forthcoming film, Stanley Kubrick Considers the Bomb, is a short documentary that looks at Kubrick's rather personal relationship with the very real threat of nuclear war that was riding a crest following the Cuban Missile Crisis and the then burgeoning so-called Cold War, just as Dr. Strangelove was going into production. We're happy to know that Wells's insightful and considerate new retrospective will in fact be shown as an introductory piece at the new 4K restoration of Dr. Strangelove that's hitting select theaters beginning in mid-2019. But just so you know, among Wells's other work, he's previously shown his keen eye for Kubrick with the making of Work and Play, a short film about The Shining, which accompanied the movie's re-release just in time for Halloween back in 2017. Matt has also directed work for Channel 4's Random Acts, Sony Music, and the BFI, among others. So I'm now going to hand your ears over to Stephen, who spoke with Matt recently about his work in Kubrick's universe. But, listener beware, if at any time during this civilian broadcast, someone by the name of Ripper attempts to confiscate your radio, your phone, or your tablet, do not, I repeat, do not contact Civil Air Defense. Simply find the nearest phone booth, the first available dim-witted U.S. Army sergeant, have a Coke and a smile, and go about your normal listening routine. Over to you, Stephen. Hi, Matt. How are you? Very well, thank you. Good. Thanks for uh, coming on the show. I recently saw your uh, Stanley Kubrick Considers the Bomb uh, short documentary, and I really enjoyed it. So uh, here we go. We'll start by asking about your background and connection to Park Circus. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, I've been making documentaries of one kind or another for the last close to 10 years, I suppose, starting out as a student. I was studying um, at the University of Warwick and I found that I could get my hands on little academic research grants and nobody was too bothered about what the form the work took and so I was using it essentially as um, 
small budgets for little documentary projects. Mm. Whatever I, you know, subject matter I could find with whatever camera equipment I could borrow and what have you, and have sort of kept it going one way or another. Um, yeah. Since then, um, been at Park Circus. So Park Circus are a they're a film distribution company, and they they basically work with um, all of the Hollywood studios and a number of other library holders to represent their their sort of back catalogues of movies. So the company sort of sits on this treasure trove of of great films, mm. and it's part of what I do for them is is making films like this that kind of dig into some of those and tell some of the stories connected with those movies. Yeah, they've got a, they've got a very uh, good selection of films. I was looking at the website a few days ago. Mm. I think I think they've got maybe twelve of the thirteen Kubrick films. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so all right. So so this the new film you've made is kind of it's been uh, put together because of this new 4K release of Doctor Strange Love that's being released pretty much around uh, the UK and Ireland and also a few uh, places around Europe. Mm-hmm. So your, your your new short film is called Stanley Kubrick considers the bomb. Uh, this is a film that uh, you directed. Um, could you tell us about the concept of this? You know, did, did, did Park Circus come to you and, and give you the concept or did they ask you to do a bit of research and come up with a concept for this short? How did that occur? It's um, this one, I mean, you know, speaking to the, the, the distribution guys at Park Circus, there was a feeling that, um, I mean, the, the, the new 4K restoration was on its way, but there was a feeling that the film was... Perhaps more topical than it had been for a little while. Mm-hmm. Nuclear war was in the headline. Not the threat of nuclear war was in the was in the headlines. Yeah, um, and it, it felt like a sort of timely moment to revisit it. And so the idea of putting the film back in cinemas, but trying to make something that would help contextualise it for audiences who, who who sort of may not be Kubrick aficionados and who may not know the sort of the social, historical, political, military context mm. to it yeah. you know I'm, i i didn't see a single kubrick film at the time of first release so i was you know when his last film came out as i was shot i was nine years old you know and i i you know, didn't see it till much later yeah um so <laughs> i'm coming to all these movies through you know pop references in pop culture and and the simpsons and all this kind of thing of so you, you kind of there's a sort of familiarity to them of images of uh somebody riding down on a bomb or you know the twins from the shining things like this they're so ingrained in the in the pop culture but i've been working with the kubrick estate for the last few years and you know we felt those at park circus and myself felt there was probably a, a story to be told with with them talking to them about you know why kubrick made dr strange love you know because there's something what interests me about his films in particular is 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 how they let you, what, what they tell you about him. Hmm. He's quite an interesting guy. He's quite an unusual guy. So with, with Dr. Strangelove, we're interested in this kind of Kubrick brain that's sort of processing a huge amount of information about what was going on politically and militarily in the early 60s and processing it in a way that was quite idiosyncratic. Yeah. You know, it, turning it into a comedy like that is not the obvious thing to do. So I was quite interested in sort of Going back to his thinking and his engagement with the time, that's what, really what the, what the short film is about. Well, I was interested in uh, whether or not I was going to get blown up by an H-bomb, you know. <laughs> I vaguely remember that, you know, if there was a nuclear attack, the best thing to do was hide under your desk or wear a tinfoil hat. He was terrified like everybody was. He looked at our frailty, at our vanity, the fact that we have a tendency to self-destruct, we as humans. I presume you went to the SK Archive, did you, at some point, to do a bit of yeah. research? Yeah, very much so. It's a treasure trove. So you went straight into the into the strange love uh, vaults, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, I was, again, I was familiar with the archive, some of the material in the archives from having been down there researching um, The Shining for a previous, a previous short documentary. Um, and it's, you know, it, it, it's extraordinary. There's a sort of, you can see the genesis of these projects. You can see the genesis of, of ideas that then become iconic and, and become familiar. And you can sort of see ideas being sketched out in memos mm. or on scraps of paper. And then you can see them as production stills. And then, you you know, all the way through to what you recognize from the movie. Um, 
it, it, it's kind of fascinating. You know, I, I sort of approach these things as um, with an interest in, in, in how movies come together and, and that, that same thing about the sort of Kubrick brain, you know, you've got this, this, this rich archive that tells you something about his process and his, his thinking and his attitude and how he worked that I think is, is quite rare, genuinely mm. very insightful. Um, I know a few people who who go there quite regularly, actually, to research books and things like that. Um, yeah, mm. it's kind of never ended. I went when I went down. I had one afternoon down there, and I just uh, had a look through the Clockwork Orange uh, boxes, um, and that four hours went in the blink of an eye. <laughs> it's so interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So interesting, just yeah. uh, opening the odd envelope and seeing what's in there, and yeah, what an ama- what an amazing uh, resource that is for us all. Well, it is, and it's led, it's led to quite an amazing body of work on his on Kubrick's films. That, that people people approaching them with a less with less of a focus on kind of what is appearing on screen, and much more on how it got there. And that that's really kind of where we're starting off with yeah. these documentaries. Mm. The people involved, the personalities involved, the stories behind. That sort of stuff. Yeah, and and people seem to be endlessly interested in the stories behind uh, Kubrick's movies. Uh, you know, as the years go by, um, people are just desperate to hear these things. So, yeah, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are going to be uh, excited to hear about your new short, which adds a, a, you know a little bit more um, context to the film, as you said, as you said earlier. Um, so I noticed uh, when when I managed to see the preview a few days ago, we, we do actually hear an audio recording of Kubrick, which was taken mm. from the, uh, the 1966 Jeremy Bernstein interview. Now that's I think that's a, at least an hour long, and, and it, it kind of works through all his films up to uh, just after Doctor Strangelove. Now the, the Doctor Strangelove section in that interview. It is quite long and in depth. How did you manage to distill that down, that long uh, strange love section, into um, into the, the, the kind of the sound bats that you ended up with in your documentary? Well, it's I, it's a great interview that you know you kind of Kubrick obviously didn't give that many interviews. There aren't that many recordings of him talking about his work, so it's um it's a brilliant listen, but. You know, we're, I'm looking for something quite specific in in all our interviews that we shot. You know, the material that we shot and the things that we're pulling out of the archive. We're we're quite focused on how he's engaging with the world around him and what that tells us about him as a character. You know, trying to be very focused on um, the personality and the character. Hmm. Uh, and I think what what comes across in 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 the interview and what I sort of tried to focus on in the edit is the sort of there's a sort of disarming kind of down to earth feel to the thing you know you can hear there's obviously a lot of mutual respect between Kubrick and Jeremy Bernstein who's conducting the interview um which which comes across it it feels quite it feels quite unguarded yeah and I noticed that you did get a nice little um a nice little bit where uh, Kubrick stumbles over his words a little yeah that's right yeah and that was nice to hear it's nice to, that that kind of puts a humanity in there doesn't it and he kind of he laughed at himself a little bit which which was a, a nice moment it is i think you know people get the the sort of the Kubrick myth is so pervasive and it's so dominant and it's so it's so kind of unhelpful i think in in terms of thinking about who he actually was that even a little moment like that where he just sort of fumbles his words, it it does take you by surprise a little bit when you first hear it because it's it does it's not quite in keeping with the, the image of um kind of watertight um perfectionist. Yes. You know. Which those myths and that that perception of him I think has has sort of come uncoupled from from what um people who knew him and worked with him would say about him. You know, they they've sort of snowballed. You feel um, talking to a lot of his collaborators and yeah, family members, friends, and so on. That's right. I mean, w- when he was actually alive, you know, as we know, he didn't want to uh, really speak to the press and do chat shows and things like that. And he also uh, kind of encouraged his uh, his co-workers not to really speak about him. But in the, in the 20 years since his passing, people do want to speak about him. And it is in the last 20 years that, we, that these myths have slowly kind of 
dissolved away. Uh, and these myths were basically just made up by the press because they didn't really have anything to, to say. They didn't have any facts, so they kind of made up uh, a lot of the stuff. But yeah, it's it's fantastic that now people are coming out and talking about him. Yeah, and and again, the work being done at the archive is shedding a lot of light on that. You know, for example, like the the, the shooting ratios. You know, famously, lots and lots of takes. Um, but actually, if you dig into the the continuity reports that detail how many takes, how many setups there are, it's 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 not quite what people expect it to be a mm. lot of the time. That's true. Yeah. One of the interviewees that you spoke to for the new film uh, was Eric Schlosser. Um, yeah. can, you tell, can you tell our listeners about him, how you found him and why you thought he'd be... Yeah, good? Eric's um, he's an interesting man. He's, uh, he's a writer and uh, an investigative journalist. He wrote, um, he wrote Fast Food Nation and Reefer Madness, which people may be familiar with. And then he wrote a book called Command and Control, which is basically the story of the American nuclear arsenal. Mm. And you come away from having read the thing with, you know, feeling it's, it's, it's a miracle. <laughs> there haven't been more catastrophic accidents yes. with nuclear weapons and how they're handled. You know, the, the, there's a tension in, in managing the nuclear arsenal between always and never, where you always want the weapons ready for use, but you never want them to be used yeah. unintentionally by accident. accident but it, it, it's like, it's, you said, what someone once called a delicate balance of terror, was it? In the early, in the early yeah. days? Uh, a, deli- yeah. a delicate balance, <laughs> which I think is what you've just described. You know, the, it's, 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 it's eye-opening. But, I, you know, Eric, Eric was helpful for the film because he was able to... You know, in, in, in writing that book, he did a lot of um, primary research with with people who were involved in, in, in managing the arsenal. So he, he's, he's got a, a very thorough knowledge. Mm. As well as Eric, uh, you had another couple of uh, contributors um, in, the, yeah. in the new film, uh, which was uh, Stanley's daughter, Katerina, and his brother-in-law and exec producer, Jan Harlan. Went up to Chidigbury, um, which is where Chibik lived, obviously, um, and that house is still in the family. Um, so on those interviews, um, yeah, you know, they they both they both offer quite different perspectives on the movie. Um, you know, Katrina was 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 young when it came out, so with her, I was very interested in what does it feel like to be a kid while um, during the Cold War. While there are, you know, we, we cut some of this material in the film, but there's all those civil defense videos sort of teaching you as a kid what you're supposed to do if there's a, a nuclear attack. And it's, I mean, one of the examples we use, one of the bits of film we use is people diving under a picnic blanket as if that would <laughs> yeah. do anything. Um, but it, we, we talking to Catherine, trying to get a sense of, you know, to what extent that conversation was happening in the home, to what extent she was aware of her father's interest in it. Um, with Jan, obviously he's older and so has a very different perspective, you know, different age at that time while things like the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Berlin Crisis were happening. So it was it's very helpful, although neither of them were directly involved in the movie, they were obviously close to Kubrick at the time and so can offer quite a, quite a helpful, in my view, quite a helpful perspective on, on where his, he was at mm. and what his interests were, but also on what it would feel like for different generations to be around at that time. Yeah, yeah. Are you a Kubrick fan in general? Were, or were yeah. you before before you worked on these? T- I, I suppose I am. I, I mean, I try not to. I try not to approach the films, these documentaries, as a as a fan. You know, I, I try and I try and approach them as. I think it's quite easy for somebody in my position to to let the documentary just become a little bit of a uh, a love in. You know, why yeah. why is it so great? Yeah. Like questions, which you know, there's a place for that stuff, but I don't think that's that's not what I'm. Um, interested in. I'm from. I try and put that on hold and sort of focus on um, the characters and the stories and the personalities. I think um, he's a fascinating man, and the films are fascinating in what they reveal about him. Mm. Uh, and I, I try and keep it focused on that rather than on how much I like them or don't like them. You know, I, I don't think there's much place for value judgments, for example, in my documentaries. 
Which is your fa- personal favourite? Uh, difficult question, isn't it? I think um, with Kubrick, I suppose the films are so... What, one of the reasons he's so interesting and one of the reasons I think um, people will... Um, he yeah, has such interest around him and his films is that they're also different. You know, you don't feel there's, there's commonalities between them, of course, but mm. he, 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 he sort of moves on formally um, with each movie. So I suppose there's, is there one for each mood? Maybe. Well, that, that's the thing. It's, it's slightly a trick question. Cause when, when anyone ever asks me, I mean, I know the first film that got me into Kubrick, it was seeing a clockwork orange, but my favourite film, yeah. it actually changes from month to month, <laughs> or um, depending on which one I've just watched. So there isn't, yeah. a, there isn't an ultimate favourite. So I think it was a slightly unfair question to, to try you I with. I think at the moment uh, I have to say it's Dr. Strangelove, don't I? Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure when I go down to watch it, um, watch a 4K version next month um, in the theatre, I'm sure that'll suddenly rise straight to the top of the list again for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works, isn't it, with Kubrick films? I think most people feel that way. Yeah, it is. I mean, they you know they're films that reward uh, close attention and they reward close looking. And you know, I'm, I think I'm the same as you. You know, whichever one I watch most recently is going to be foremost in my mind, and I will have found new things, no doubt, as I do each time I watch them. Yeah, you briefly mentioned the f- the, the first. Kubrick documentary that you made for Park Circus, which was, mm. uh, again, you directed it, and that was a short film called Work and Play, a short film about The Shining, and that was released uh, for Halloween 2017 uh, when uh, Park Circus did a kind of theatrical run of The Shining. That's a great film as well. Um, you interviewed... Thank you. You're welcome. You interviewed Lisa and Louise Burns, who played the Grady twins, and they, they haven't done many mm. interviews. Um, no. quite, quite rare that you, you get them talking, so... So what was it? What was it like uh, speaking to the two ladies there? Oh, it was fantastic. They were very good. Um, they good company. They, you know, they they were very very down to us. Very easy to talk to. Very very sort of open about their their memories of the film. And their memories of the film are quite quite unusual in that you you've got a sort of how old were they when the film was made? They were sort of like nine something like that. I can't remember exactly, but you've got yeah somewhere around yeah there. you've got this sort of pretty extraordinary. Um, perspective on filmmaking that they had at that young age and they then you know had nothing else to do with the movies at all uh so in a sense you you've got people who can kind of recall this this sort of chance eye view of the of the, the filmmaking process i mean we know you know filmmaking is this sort of laborious kind of almost industrial process but their view on it was mm. you know you could approach a hotel and you'd walk past the facade and you'd realize the whole thing was held up on on scaffolds and this to a nine-year-old was yeah mind blowing um so it's kind of amazing to be able to sort of for them to be able to recall that point of view on the camera on on, on camera for us and also you had the pleasure of speaking with garrett brown who obviously is the guy that invented the steady cam yeah. and, and did the great shots in the shining and you also spoke to um kubrick's co-writer for on the shining which was diane johnson uh, both both fascinating you know talking to anyone who's worked with kubrick is always interesting um Mm. it's it's you know with diane she's sort of recalling long evenings sat at the kitchen table eating takeaway and working on the script with kubrick and you just sort of think what sort of what an incredible (laughs) what an incredible thing to be able to recall it's uh, it's 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 striking but she's um very eloquent woman very talented writer obviously so it was it was it was wonderful to interview her um similarly with garrett Mm. you know it's um the steady cam that camera work is such a such an important part of the way the movie works and i think the way the movie kind of burrows its way into your into your mind um is 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 the camera work which obviously the, the steady cam was was vital in in achieving that some of the um had it not come along when it did i think it would be quite a different movie in some ways um mm. It looks like the interviews that you did for the for the Shining short was done in a cinema. Was that at the the um, at the St Albans uh, screening? When, no, when they all, that all went down was there? it. No. it oh, where was it? It was um, at Ells Tree in a screening room at Ells Tree. Oh. Oh, right. uh, it was the thirty fifth anniversary reunion for the film, mm. and there was a screening in the evening in St Albans, as you as you say. But earlier in the day, everyone yeah. had been at the studio 
where it was filmed um, for a chat, a catch up, all these different people involved in The Shining, just sort of having a drink and some and some food. And we we set up in a in a screening room nearby and were sort of asking people as they as they found time over the course of the day to come and chat with us a bit on on camera about the film. Great. Yeah, I attended the uh, the St Albans screening later in the mm. day. Uh, I think it was like maybe about four four o'clock in the afternoon. Mm. Uh, fan- that was fantastic to see all, all those uh, casting crew members together again. Mm. Uh, there must have been about twenty five of them. Uh, yeah, fantastic get together. Yeah. Is it is it likely that your two Kubrick films will make it onto future home video releases? Do you think? I suspect they will find their way there eventually. Yes. Mm, good. Because it'd be great uh, for other people to see them who can't quite make it to the uh, to the theatres yeah, to see absolutely. them. Right, so, um, coming to the end of this now, uh, how are you feeling? Yeah, good, good, thanks. I feel I've finally uh, woken up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, um, uh, so as we mentioned earlier, Park Circus, it looks like they hold licences to maybe 12 of Kubrick's mm. 13 features. Are there plans for any more releases and accompanying short films in the future? We will, we will see. We are looking at a couple of things at the moment, so... so Nothing I can talk about yet, but watch this space. Right. Intriguing. All right, all right, all right. Hey, big thanks to Matt Wells for talking with us about his latest film, Stanley Kubrick Considers the Bomb, and also to Sony and Park Circus, who provided us with the two trailers that we heard in this episode. Now, if you're tempted to witness Dr. Strangelove on the big screen in all its remastered glory, and I know that you are, then be sure to check out the screening dates at parkcircus.com. This gorgeous print is soon to be screening along with Matt Wells' new documentary in Austria, the Netherlands, Norway, the Republic of Ireland, Spain, Turkey, and the United Kingdom. Now, I've been to one world fair, a picnic, and a rodeo, and if and I lived in one of them countries, I'd be sure I got the missus, the kids, even my old hound dog, I mean the entire family, over to a showing of this immortal classic on the silver screen, even if it hair-lipped everybody on Bear Creek. <clears throat> but... If you can't make it to one of those screenings, then it is definitely worth it to grab the Criterion Edition on Blu-ray. This latest home video release includes the 17-minute Exhibitors trailer, which was narrated for promotional purposes by Stanley himself, along with a number of other cool extras, including a new interview with the guy that we spoke with all the way back on Kubrick's Universe Episode 1, our friend, author, and Kubrick scholar, Mick Broderick. Okay, a quick word about ratings and reviews. If you'd be so kind as to give us a favorable one, hey, we'd be very grateful. The team at Kubrick's Universe takes a lot of pride and care in making a show that we as Kubrick fans would want to listen to ourselves. So if you'd like to click the proverbial like button and or say something nice about the podcast, if you enjoy it, then thank you. We're going to leave you now with a groove-tastic, super swinging, way out and wacky, pretty little ditty brought to our attention by James Marinaccio called Love That Bomb. It's by Dr. Strangelove and the Fallouts. Now, this kooky little number was actually created by Columbia Records as a bit of a cross-promotional jingle to get radio listeners interested in the new film by Stanley Kubrick. And all the way back in the spring of 64, this catchy and super sassy song entered the Billboard Hot 200 singles charts at number 199 with a bullet. With a bullet. I said, with a bullet. Yes, that's more like it. Excellent. Okay, thanks for listening, everybody. We'll meet again. From all of us to all of you, good night, and please, don't worry about the bomb. Okay, maybe worry just a little bit. Just a little. A little bit. A little bit. Ten, nine, eight, seven... Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Bye.
It's Kubrick's universe. We just live in it. We have taken very thorough precautions in this podcast against broadcasting anything which might only be attributed to human error. Thank you for listening to the Stanley Kubrick Podcast. Come back soon.